from a very high level, iDev is a, um, we effectively work on cross-sector collaboration in emerging markets to bring NGOs, uh, private sector organizations, multinationals together to create a slightly more profitable and impactful um, economy and, and create a stronger ecosystem. Our focus is East Africa, West Africa, and Latin America. The, all those green countries are countries where we've worked. We've got offices in Lima, Nairobi, and San Francisco, which is, um, it'll become a little bit more apparent in the impact investing space while we're in San Francisco. Uh, how we do this, two main things, business strategy, um, so basic normal management consulting uh, for small, medium-sized businesses, PMEs in, in emerging markets, Latin America. We help them with go-to-market strategy. We help them with new market entry. We help them with supply chain consulting, kind of typical management consultancy stuff. Um, and then the other side, which is the part that I head up, is the investment advisory group. And that is effectively two main parts. That is working with investment funds, helping them enter new markets, so pipeline mapping, um, due diligence, sometimes kind of restructuring portfolios that are underperforming. And then on the sell side for businesses, it's working with them to help them strengthen themselves and get themselves ready for fundraising, taking them to market, getting together the investors that could be interesting, taking them through the due diligence process all the way through to disbursement. If I'm talking quickly, it's because I'm trying to get this done quickly for you, you guys, for your benefit. Um, so the impact investing sector. The impact investing sector, if you see at the top, the Monitor Institute, um, Monitor Institute speculated the impact investing sector was going to be between $500 billion by 2020. It's a very fast-growing market. A year later, JP Morgan and Rockefeller Foundation sized the market to be between $400 billion and a trillion. And then two years later, the Calvert Foundation, which is a, a large private foundation in the US, uh, speculated the market would be worth $650 billion. Um, we're going to explain a little bit more about what the impact investing sector is. So the impact investing sector is, it, it's, it's effectively investors that are looking to generate financial return and impact, social impact at the very same time. And they're not putting financial return before social impact, and they're not putting social impact before financial return. So moving from the traditional investing, you've got basically anything. You can invest in nuclear power, you can invest in unsustainable extractive industries, take out some, some sin stocks, so basically take out gambling, take out tobacco, take out extractive industries that aren't particularly sustainable, and you get to SRI, which is socially responsible investing, or sustainable, sustainably responsible investing. And that's, a, that's called effectively negative screening. Moving a little bit further to the left, you've got positive screening. Positive screening is implementing ESG criteria, so that's environmental, social, and governance best practices into businesses and saying we can invest in businesses if they're actively looking to implement ESG criteria. Going from sustainable investing over to impact investing is effectively saying we're going to invest in, in those businesses that are actively implementing ESG, but we need to be able to measure the social impact that they're having. So just taking that a little bit further, that brings <coughs> Jory to talk about what a social enterprise is, and that would be the, the focus of these social impact investors is what Joey's going to talk about. Hola a todos. Uh, gracias. <laughs> um, OK, so, so thanks for that. So that, that's a good overview of impact investing. And impact investments, well, they invest in social enterprises. And it, what is a social enterprise? There's a, lot of question, there's a lot of answers to that question. So I'm going to pull the most popular one, which is from Wikipedia. And according to Wikipedia, a social enterprise is an organization that applies commercial strategies to maximize improvements in human and environmental well-being rather than maximizing profits for external shareholders. That's a really long definition. It's kind of confusing. And I actually think a little bit deceiving, too. Um, in my opinion, when we talk about social enterprises, there are multiple components. There's absolutely the social and environmental component. And that's extremely core to these type of enterprises. Uh, but I don't necessarily think that enterprises sacrifice financial profitability in order to achieve those positive outcomes. And that's where I think this definition is misleading. So let's just change it up a little bit. And we're going to make it really simple. We're going to say a social enterpri enterprise is an organization that maximizes financial, social, and environmental impact. So wh what really does that mean? Let, I'm, I'm going to explain social enterprises through a couple of stories and examples. And let, let's start with me. Um, I, right now, I, I lead an impact investing fund in Toronto. But before that, 
I started up a social enterprise in Tanzania, East Africa. When I was in business school, I learned about business, uh, unsurprisingly, about finance and operations and marketing, but I wanted to do a little bit something meaningful with those skill sets. And so I hopped on a plane to East Africa and I teamed up with Mohammed and we started a social enterprise all around the, the concept of honey. And the business model was to distribute beehives to local women entrepreneurs on credit, guaranteed to purchase all their harvested honey at fair market value, and then sell it for more. Uh, so for us, we get a lot of honey, we sell it in bulk, we make a lot of money. For our women, our women entrepreneurs, they get revenue streams that they wouldn't have before. They wouldn't have before. And, and that's really important, not just for the revenue stream, but the way that, that they actually spend that revenue stream. Uh, in Tanzania, statistically, men spend money, to, to too much money on non-productive items like, like alcohol. Women, on the other hand, invest in their families through education and through healthy cooking supplies. And, and that's where the social enterprise concept comes to play. Uh, really quickly, um, in, in Tanzania as well, I worked with the talented musician in Kali Nukta, which translates to the great full stop. Uh, really talented musician, but in order to succeed in Tanzania, what you need is a music video. And we financed one together. Um, and the reason why I'm telling you this is really, I understand that Kali Nukta isn't necessarily a business, he's a person, um, but the, the concept of social enterprises at work. Uh, before I met Nukta, uh, he couldn't afford um, three meals a day, he couldn't afford a roof on his head. Uh, afterwards, after the music video aired nationwide on different te television stations, he could. Um, I also played on a basketball team, but that's not really too relevant. Uh, it, now, it, in Chile, um, really quick with social enterprises, there are quite, there are a number, and, and they're very, very powerful. Um, one here is called Toll. Toll increases access to clean, potable water, and they do this in the community of Boyanar in, in Chile. Green Libros, uh, what they do, uh, unfortunately, a lot of books, a lot of textbooks, once somebody reads them, they either end up in landfills uh, or they sit idle on a shelf. And they end up in landfills because a lot of the recycling plants that process books can actually process the glue. Um, so despite good intentions of, of recycling, these end up in landfills. So what Green Libros does is they take books, every single book, they do something positive. They either resell it at affordable prices, uh, they uh, recycle them, or they donate them to in-need libraries. Uh, Upasol uh, in, in Vicuña, um, uh, what they do is they operate a recycling program. So they go and they go to each household and they collect recycling and they take it in and then they sell it to, um, they sell it to companies who use that material in their, in their production processes. Uh, a big problem here is recycling. Over only about 7% um, of waste, annual waste in Chile is recycled and this, this helps increase that number. So when we talk about social enterprises, those are some examples. Um, and I want to go back to something that I mentioned earlier is the, because there, there is a focus on social and environmental mandates, uh, there's a widespread perception uh, that that focus actually hinders profitability. But I think it's actually untrue. I think it's the opposite. It, it, the focus on positive impact propels profitability to higher levels. And I have a theory why. Um, and it, it comes down to three, uh, I guess, three, three criteria here. Uh, the ability to, to have operations with, that do good for the world with social and environmental mandates uh, have the ability to uh, not only attract top leadership and talent, but retain it, which is extremely important. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason there is because you can align personal interests with business interests. Supply chain resilience uh, is another reason that, that drives the competitive advantage. Everyone knows here that in order for a company to be successful, their supply chain has to be very strong. In order to make it strong, what social enterprises do is they rely on meaningful transactions and relationships. They invest in their supply chain through education and through fair payment structures. And in times of low supply, suppliers will actually, uh, according to what we've seen here, is provide these social enterprises with a very good quality product when there's not a lot available. And in terms of evolving consumer demand, Consumers, uh, they're adapting. It's not just a sticker price that people are worrying about anymore. It's being um, local supply chain. It's being certified organic. It's employing uh, people who face barriers to employment. All those factors, uh, consumers are demanding a more holistic value proposition from products and services, and social enterprises are 
are fulfilling that. Oh, that's me. That's you. <laughs> um, so, I mean, just before kind of moving into this, one thing that I, I think is quite important for, for today to make it more relevant for you guys is that um, you know, a, lot of these, a lot of these companies that you see in the social, the, the social impact investing space, you know, they're quite sexy companies. They're quite high tech. There's a lot of innovative technology going on there. So, for example, if you're thinking about, um, in a lot of um, you know, countries that are trying to get successful in East, West Africa or Latin America, they've got to figure out how they can get out to rural populations. There's nothing to do with this slide. I'm just, my slides are loads of deleted, so I'm kind of talking about those ones. Um, figuring out how you can get out to rural populations. And that means, so for example, renewable energy, getting renewable energy out for rural clinics or rural, uh, rural clinics or rural schools takes a distribution approach which, is, which needs to be innovative. Or for example, coming up with clean cook stoves that are, um, minimize the carbon emissions from cooking with charcoal, you've got to come up with some very high tech innovation. So for example, having fans in there that gets the charcoal to a higher, um, higher temperature, so it burns the emission several times over before it leaves the stove. There's some very high tech ways of actually getting, one, the products out to the end users, and two, the types of products that are going to be appealing to those end users. Now, this, this is basically saying, up until I would say about 10, 15 years ago, the majority of multinationals in the world were focused on number one and number two, uh, strata one and two in the world. And that's basically 750 to 100 million people in the, you know, the richest right at the top of the pyramid, and that's probably everybody in this room. And then two is effectively from about six, seven thousand dollars on average income a year up to about twenty thousand dollars. And then three and down to four, you're talking about those people on about six thousand dollars a year and below. And that's that's about four, four point five billion people. Businesses were not trying to channel uh, their products to those people 10, 15 years ago. And then you started with Pantene. I don't know if you've seen those shampoo products. They're basically selling them in little sachets in shops, and you can get them in all over Chile as well, making them uh, $1, little $1 pouches or 50 cents pouches, suddenly makes it accessible to people that can't afford to buy a bottle. So you've got to think of innovative ways of, of actually getting, um, getting products out, but the market is massive. The majority of people in the world fit into this market. Now, why, other than the fact that it's a massive market, why are people starting to move in this direction, and specifically why are investors trying to move in this direction? Well, one, it's to do with priorities between the generations. We just come out of, you know, the, we're the millennials and the Generation X. Baby boomers came before us, and, and interestingly enough, the ones before them were the silent generation. So baby boomer generation were known for, they got to new levels of education. They had a, a huge amount of drive for achievement, and that's really what the focus was in the 1950s, 60s. And they had a lot of optimism coming out of the, the post-war period, a lot of growth in economies, um, and basically a lot of growing wealth from that. Gladly for us, we inherit all that wealth. So that 40 trillion that they generated is coming down to the millennials and Generation X. But we've been, you know, we've grown up in a different, different, different era. We've been growing up in global awareness. So most people growing up today, I mean, you just need to look at this room. There's people from, there's a blonde guy from Russia over there. I'm from the UK. He, a lot of people from Canada. I mean, it's quite a global room. There he goes. He's waving. Blonde guy from Russia. Um, and so there's a lot more global awareness. We're also a lot more aware of the global issues. And so we're more exposed to issues in Latin America, issues in Asia, issues in Europe, issues in North America. We're also uh, exposed more to tech and innovation. And that breaks down those geographical barriers as well. The key thing here, though, is business's role in society. So this, this thing down here at the bottom is Deloitte Consulting Group did uh, an, a study of what millennials thought was the primary purpose for doing business. And 36%, they're on a weighted average, 36%, the, the, the biggest response was to improve society. Rather worryingly, the, the least response was to actually create wealth. So I'm not really sure where the millennials are going with that, but most people want to improve society, and that's what they think business is for. And that's really quite powerful, and that means people are looking to improve society when they go into business now. Additionally, and this is kind of moving on from the, um, the kind of traditional financial services or the traditional financing sector was focused on purely financial returns. Now, that means there's a million different private wealth managers out there that can say, I'm going to get you double-digit returns this year, next year, and the, the, the year after. And so give me your wealth, and I'll manage it. There's no differentiation between the people that are offering those services. 
if you're able to offer a service that says, I'm going to get you double-digit returns, plus I'm going to also get a lot of people out of poverty or get people uh, well-being improved in certain regions of the, co of the country or of the globe, that's an additional value add that you can provide with your portfolio. And so a lot of people are, one, getting client demand. This is to go into SRI investments in the US. So this isn't even going to, this is going to a wealthy country. Um, most people that moved into SRI investing was because clients were demanding they moved into it. They wanted them to move into it, and they felt that that was a way that they could differentiate themselves from the, from the competition. A little bit more focused on Latin America, um, and this is one of the really the key reasons why it's becoming more and more important here to get sustainable businesses to drive development, is that aid is massively decreasing. So, I mean, USAID is basically not doing anything in Peru anymore. It's the whole Andean region, it's starting to kind of like figure out its structured exit. It's already been kicked out of Bolivia. Uh, I'm not saying USAID is the only kind of form of aid, but it's just a proxy for what's happening in, uh, in other parts of the world as well. And if you look at it, Peru, this is just also a proxy of some countries in, in, uh, in Latin America. You know, Peru's growing at 5.5%, Colombia at 4%, Chile at 6%. Average income in 2010 in Chile was $15,000. Now, these are all coming middle-income countries, and so the need for, for, for kind of aid and NGO work and unsustainable projects to get people out of poverty, these other countries don't want to be, they don't want to be pouring money into that anymore. They want to pour money into sustainable development, developing business ecosystems. They can actually get people out of, biz get people out of poverty and you know, kind of get people, uh, get incomes increased, but in a sustainable fashion. It's also increasing the amount of money that's going to, going to uh, other parts of the world, like Africa. So that's why impact investing is, is becoming very important in Latin America. Where is most of the, most of the, impact, investing, most of the impact investing funds going? So the most funds are focused on sub-Saharan Africa. In Latin America and the Caribbean, um, there's, there's several hubs here. There's a hub in Mexico, which is with the, where probably the biggest market for impact investing in Latin America. The other hub is going to be just south, kind of from the uh, south, southern border of Mexico with the Darien Gap. That point, Guatemala acts as the hub there. And then you've got Colombia acts as a hub for the northern Andes. And then Peru acts as a hub for the southern Andes. And then Brazil is just a massive market with a lot, of, um, a lot of potential growth. And so with potential growth comes a lot of opportunities. So there's a lot of investing going on there as well. What do they invest in typically? Um, now, Jonah um, alluded to this a little bit earlier, but the, the key themes that most investors are focused on, agriculture. Now, this is kind of driven by the fact that most economies in Latin America are agrarian-based economies anyway. So, for example, if you go to a lot of these, a lot of the drivers are, um, well, agro-exports is the biggest driver in a lot of them. Admittedly, in, in Chile, that's not really the case because it's extractive um, minerals. Agriculture, what are they looking to do with agriculture? If you're looking to actually measure social impact, it's what's the, improve, the, the improved yields with farmers that you're dealing with. For health, it's take a, take a disease like diabetes or heart diseases. What is the reduced mortality rate from applying your particular device or applying your particular product to that sector? Financial services could be how many more people have microinsurance in a particular country? Education, again, it's the literacy rate is one way, of, of one, one way of measuring it. Or percentage of girls in secondary schooling. Housing, housing would be affordable housing for rural communities. So number of homeless in a particular city, for example. Energy, people have access to energy that are off grid. Um, typical sizes of businesses. I would say most funds, um, most funds that are focused on Latin America are focused on, um, so, in, in North America and Europe, you've got a good banking system. You've got a banking system that works. So if you are a mid-sized business and you want to get a, a, you want to get a, a loan and you've got, let's say, $50,000 in revenue, you can get a pretty cheap loan. That doesn't, I mean, that, again, that's a little bit more structured in Chile, but in a lot of other countries in Latin America, that's not really the case. If you want to get loans and you're a small business, you're going to get them at exorbitant rates. Angel infrastructure. There is really no angel infrastructure in a lot of countries. There's not as established as the US, Canada, Australia. Um, and so if you want to get that seed A, or you, know, you want to expand your family and friends around, it's a little bit more difficult to do. So a lot of these funds are coming down to where angel investors would normally play in the market. So they're 
they're investing, I would say, between the, the latter stage launching process, the kind of C pluses, where you're up to $300,000, $400,000, and then you've got the consolidation and proof of model. Those C plus and B is where a lot of these funds are focused, and they'll be investing between, I would say, 80% of funds will be investing between $500,000 and $2.5 million in businesses to get them to scale and help them grow so they can get to that next, that next uh, private equity round, which is kind of five, ten, fifteen million dollars and above. And then access to capital comes when, you know, suddenly you've got access to banking finance that's affordable. I mean, just to give you an example, uh, you know, taking I know the Peruvian economy better than, than other economies in Latin America, but if you're a small business in Peru and you want to go to Interbank to get to get a loan, you're talking fifteen percent. If you've got a million dollars plus or two million dollars in revenue, you can get it down to eight percent. It suddenly starts to become competitive. So once you get to the $2 million plus point, you're, you're kind of fine. Well, not fine, but you're, you're getting on your way. All right, that's it. Yeah, so that's what happens when you mix two presentations together. <laughs> well done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Are we taking questions? Or no? Yeah, I think we're done. Yeah, OK. Has anyone got any questions? <laughs> I'm going to take that as a n Oh, yeah. Is there any a specific uh, sort of a business that you invest in? Like, uh, are you looking for some sort of uh, uh, area, uh, industries, or just any any business? Is that to you? Oh, to me. So basically, I mean, we see too many agro businesses, and so most funds that we work with are too focused on. Well, they have too much of their portfolio in agro. And so they're looking for IT businesses. They're looking for innovative tech businesses, um, businesses that are really doing things that are happening in Silicon Valley, happening in other parts of the world, but are just very different to what's kind of, there's a plethora of fairly boring, early mid-sized businesses that are happening in Latin America and not that much innovation. And so that's what they're really looking for. So for example, there's quite a few really interesting businesses. Well, most of the businesses that I've spoken to this week have been really fascinating and they've come up with some exciting ways of kind of breaking the market and expanding to fairly big populations. For most of the funds that we work with, I'd say that, that, that they're at that kind of stage a little, a little bit too early. Once they get a, their revenues up a bit higher, then they're going to be exactly the, the right types of businesses that most of these funds will be looking for. Thanks. And I, I think I'll, I'll just jump in to give you a different perspective. Um, the fund that I run, we're sector agnostic. So we're looking for impact everywhere. And that means tech, that means lifestyle. And, and the way that we structure our investments is, is we structure for exits. Um, so we're not necessarily always looking for that home run that a number of folks have, have alluded to here. Um, but we're trying to structure exits after a certain return threshold. And that can come from tech, but that can come from agriculture, education, from any other lifestyle company. That's more towards a social, what you call social entrepreneurship. Uh, everything, yeah, social. So for us, we're asking the... the well, for me, because um, I studied a, a master's degree in, in, in Sydney, Australia, and uh, well, I, I got a, a social entrepreneurship um, course. <coughs> and um, for me, it's, a, well, in my opinion, it's very difficult to define whether there's a social impact or not in a business, because in any way, every business generates a social impact, right? So, so what's this? Is there any, you know, line that separates a social enterprise from just an enterprise? In a way, you can actually say, well, this one impacts the social. And yeah. I don't know. Um, no, I, can, I, I, well, can I start with that one? Yeah, I'll, I'll take it after. So, sure. um, there's, there's a, there's, I, I, it's a great question because. It's, there's a lot of confusion in the market about if a business creates employment, it has a social impact. If it's, if it's promoting economic development, it has a social impact. But what a lot of investors are looking for is, uh, and I'm not saying this is for right or for wrong, but what a lot of investors are looking for is something that is very focused on improving the well-being of somebody or doing something that's not currently available to a particular segment of the population. So, for example, healthcare. General provision of healthcare has a positive social impact, but there's, there's a lot of providers of healthcare in the market. So it's not really doing anything different. It's not changing a model or a market. 
provision of healthcare for low-income populations, that has a social impact. Housing, construction, in it, that in itself wouldn't be considered to have a social impact. But if you're focusing on people that are underserved by housing, that would be a social impact because you're effectively changing the status quo in the market. So most of these business, and this is, you know, like so I come from completely non-social impact space. I come from oil and gas private equity in London, which is, you know, people have enough money there to, to, to not really worry about things in the oil and gas sector. And the thing I like about this sector is that to be successful in it, there's some really interesting business models because they're looking at what's existing in the market, so housing, healthcare, cooking, and then they're twisting it around and changing it for the local market, distribution channels, products. So you get some really fascinating, innovative models out there, um, and you're effectively helping them to raise capital and get to that next level. I, I, and just real quick, because I'm, I'm happy we're not too far off, because it, it can be confusing. Um, the, the, the way that I, I look at this is it's a spectrum. I will never say that something isn't a social enterprise because it could create employment, it has benefits. Uh, but each investor has their sweet spot of what they're looking for. For us, we're, we're asking the question, for every product sold, for every service rendered, is, is something good happening in this world? And the way that we measure it is we take venture-specific metrics and, and we take a look at those. Um, but I, to your point, it's a spectrum. And I personally think each investor has their sweet spot. Hello. Can you both tell us a little bit from your perspective, what are the differences in the development of this kind of business than others? Development of this type of business than others. So for example, the development of a socially impactful business or the development of a socially impactful business in Latin America versus elsewhere? No, social impactful business, whatever. whatever. Uh, um, so for me, I would say, sorry, you can go first. I keep I'm sure. talking to you. Uh, I think the, the main difference that I see, well, there's a couple. So there's the entrepreneurs and the business I itself. But I'll go with the business first. Um, for, for us, what, what I see is that the positive impact is core to the operations, um, almost no matter what. So go back to for every product sold, for every service rendered. Um, that's what has to be focused on when you develop the enterprise because it's so core to the business model and that's what you're offering. What's, what you're offering is inherently good and so everything is going to revolve around that. And when we talk about what I see from entrepreneurs, um, I, I mean the, most entrepreneurs are, are passionate. Um, what, what I see is that they're passionate for a reason. Um, usually it has to do with something they really, really believe in because of uh, something that happened to them personally or their families, uh, and that really drives them to be motivated to, to start their social enterprise and to deliver it. Um, yeah, I mean, every business starts with a, like a need in the market. But I'd say the, the big difference that I see between those companies that are really trying to have a social impact and companies that are, that are doing, doing great things, but they're not so focused on social impact, is, is, is your, your end user. So for example, for, for companies that invariably are trying to go for social impact, they've got to identify people that are really underserved by something. And inherently, if they're underserved, they're a little bit more difficult to reach. And so I would say you always need to focus on distribution models. But from all the businesses that I deal with, and you know, we deal with a lot of businesses in, in Latin America and East Africa, the one that they always, you can have the best product in the world. But if you don't have your distribution model sorted out, you may as well, yeah, I mean, you're just not going to sell anything. You may as well be selling snow to Eskimos. Um, so you need to figure out a low-cost way of doing what is effectively quite difficult and costly to most companies. So I'd say what you focus on needs to be a little bit different. It's not just a product. It is getting your product to market. Great, thank you. Another one. Uh, if I would uh, create an accelerator for this kind of startup, what advice would you give me? Uh, I'd advise you to talk to Agora, which is a social impact accelerator focused on Latin America, and Santa Clara University. They, so they're basically Agora, I'm not going to talk about Agora, but GSBI, which is the, the Santa Clara University incubator, has um, a focus on its, the global social impact businesses um, that are incubated in, it's in Santa Clara, which is in California. Uh, and it has the whole framework that it could almost start franchising out what it does, all the toolkit, everything, for franchising out that social impact model in other parts of the world. Uh, I don't work for an accelerator incubator, so I'd love to give you a bit more advice than that, but I really, I mean, I, I, it would be useless. 
Yeah, GSBI is a very good example. Uh, there's also a number in Canada as well. Um, but uh, I think from what I'm seeing in Canada, the, the support services, uh, they need to be tailored towards impact. Uh, they have to have impact in mind all the time, and they have to have the entrepreneur's motivations in mind too. But I, I, I agree with Patrick. It's best to, to chat with those folks who are the experts. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's one at the back. No? <laughs> no, no, that's good. I think we're done. Okay. Yeah. Gracias. Yeah, thanks. Cheers.